are going to talk about my diet, Emma. Thank you very much for giving me your time. And you wanted to start, as I've already sent you my week's um, intake of food, which I told you, you might be surprised by. I kind of tend to work with people and suggest swap. Well, I don't think there's such a thing as there is a perfect diet. Well, there isn't. There isn't. It, it is very individual. I've been doing this for some time. I'm 56. I do know that as you, as your age changes, that there are more things you need to prioritise. And I've also got my supplements here to discuss afterwards. This works for you. You know your body better than anybody else. And that's why you always say to clients, you know, you do you brilliantly. You know, you know what works. So, yes, we can talk about little shifts and swaps and what you might want to think about. But essentially, it needs to work for you and your lifestyle and your job and, you know, all of these kind of extra factors. So how are we going to start this? Because you've obviously sent me quite a detailed overview of what you've eaten for the last seven days, right? I, I didn't eat breakfast when I went to school. I've never been a breakfast person. And, and since I've been allowed to make my own rules, uh, that's just the way it's moved. And it's the easy, easy way for me. And it's how you, it's how your body wants to work. Because for lots of people, and myself, I'm the same, breakfast makes me feel really nauseous if I have it too early. So I cannot eat before a certain time. And, and that's common for lots of people. So yeah, I think we need to almost un... Um, educate what we've been told which is breakfast is the most important meal of the day it is in some respects but it doesn't mean that you have to have it at 7 a.m. I think it was Mr Kellogg's that made that rule yes it was it was you know so yeah it, there's a lot of marketing at play here isn't there yes there is and, and, so, and Kellogg's tastes great I mean, if you yeah. have a bowl of Frosties yum yeah yeah yeah, yeah. if that's your bag totally um, but yeah quite high in sugar, quite low in fiber. Talk to me about, about your mornings then. I like to exercise fasted. If I'm going for a long run, then I'll have to eat early. David will get up two or three hours before he's exercising if he's got a really hard session. Um, Specifically so that he can fuel, right? Yes, exactly. And then get everything moving, get the system moving before he gets out there. Yes, because that's something at play, isn't it? If you eat first before a long run, it, you can, it can bring on a big bowel movement and which is obviously not ideal you'll be doing a Paula Radcliffe you, so you do a fasted kind of training and that's everyday training so five five seven kilometers yeah and then when you get back after training what would you what was your what would your intake look like? coffee in a big mug it's half coffee half uh, soy milk everyone who seems to metabolize caffeine very differently that's not ideal if you're drinking it throughout the day so the limits the kind of recommended intake is quite a lot actually it's about four or five cups of coffee a day for my kind of perimenopause menopause clients if they're suffering from anxiety and if they're having problems sleeping i would always recommend that they try to have that intake earlier on in the day rather than later just like a well caffeine has a really long what we call a half-life so it means that a lot of people metabolize it very slowly so if you've had one in the afternoon it can still be in your system you know, when you're going to bed. I think having lived on Diet Pepsi for so many years, I don't think that caffeine uh, affects me at all, but who knows? I mean, because you don't yeah. do you unless you don't do it. You don't know how it affects you, and then your age has changed, and then you don't know if it was the age that changed it or whether it was the caffeine that changed it. I think, and also, we need to remember that it has quite a lot of... Uh, you know, benefits too. So it's really good for people who exercise. It, uh, caffeine can be really good for people who are looking after, you know, man trying to manage their weight. It's sociable, you know, coffee drinkers are supposed to live longer than non-coffee drinkers. It can increase your energy levels. So, you know, there's definitely pros, but I would say, as I'm probably going to say in most things that we talk about today, everything in moderation. I don't think about food. It doesn't cross my mind until maybe one or two. So let's say it did, would you eat or will you try and push yourself through because you are fasting, I'm assuming? Uh, no, if I, if I feel like I need to eat something at 11, then I would have yeah. a bit of cheese probably. So then your first, usually then your first meal is around midday. Yeah, but it wouldn't be a meal. 
I very often go to the fridge, you know, and there is nothing, and I'm the shopper. There's nothing that my body says I really want that. So I find it quite hard sometimes to think of what to eat. So I would tend to grab a chunk of cheese and I, I slice it very thinly nibble on that while I'm doing admin. So I noticed in the info that you sent me, you said that you had 200 grams of cheese, which is quite a sizable amount. Did you mean 20 grams? Three hundred and fifty grams. So if that's three hundred and fifty, but that's not so that's all. All yeah, you know, within that's not like a meal that I would eat in ten minutes. One go. It's spaced out. Yeah, over an hour, maybe even. Okay. I mean, not that it matters whether you eat it in one go or not. Um, <laughs> just something to be aware of with regards to cheese is that it's quite high in saturated fat post-menopausal or kind of post-51, half of us actually will die of cardiovascular disease. That is the, 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 big, the biggest killer of women post-menopausally. So we do have to really concentrate on our heart health. So one of those ways in which I know you're doing is HRT, which is cardioprotective. The guidelines are 20 grams of saturated fat per day for women, 30 grams for men and actually that's not a lot so in 200 grams of cheese that's about 60 grams of saturated fat already okay all right well i can cut down on that i that's yeah. not the end i think exactly just about being aware the, the guidelines would would say try to increase your unsaturated fats and decrease saturated so decrease things like butter cheese and increase things, you know, the good healthy fats that we're always banging on, on about, which is olive oil, avocados, nuts, seeds, all of those things, which I think you probably already enjoy anyway, don't you? Yes, I do. They're cardioprotective for a start. So they're a big part of the Mediterranean diet, which is the diet that everybody holds up as, as the kind of flagship for healthy diets. Okay, I can do that. Take right. Thick. Um, <laughs> so you drink soy milk, which is great. Do you drink, so do, are you anti-dairy? Uh, um, I just don't like it uh, very yeah. much. So this, yeah. I put a little bit of oat milk in with my soy milk. Yeah, lovely. So I would just make sure that, that any kind of plant milk is fortified, so fortified with calcium. There are lots of different fortified milks out there, but yeah. M&S, um, they include iodine. I think they're one of the few people that actually do. And iodine is super important for metabolism, so for thyroid health. A fortified plant milk has the identical kind of protein profile and calcium profile as cow's milk. The beauty of soy milk is that it's high in protein. It's a complete protein. Um, and again, it's, it's on a par with, um, with cow's milk. So soy, I think, is really useful, particularly for peri- and post-menopausal women. So there isn't any robust evidence to say that it does. So I think a couple of portions a day is actually really helpful. It could be really helpful for hot flushes and things like that. Fortified all the way, right? Fortified, because for a, for a woman post-50, you're looking at 1,200 milligrams of calcium a day. And if you're not getting that in your milk, whether it's fortified plant milk or cow's milk, it's actually quite a high number. It's quite hard. It's quite a hard target to, to hit. Yes, and especially when you need bone health. Yeah, that is one thing that I think is is really important. Okay, next. Next. You said that you ate these whole wheat biscuits. Uh, it, that's like a mid kind of afternoon snack. Yeah, I wouldn't normally do that. I just okay. create. Like I told you, I go to the cupboard and. Normally, there is nothing there that, that even a custard cream. I'm not allowed to eat anything sweet during the week. So, uh, if you say, Do you want a custard cream? It's not going to pass my lips. So, I saw okay. this and I just thought, oh, Marmite biscuit. Yes, I love Marmite. I just feel like a Marmite biscuit. I'm glad actually that you don't omit gluten because I think a lot of people do under the kind of premise that it's inflammatory or you know it's bad for your gut health but actually there's no proven evidence to say that that's the case and if you take out gluten you're actually taking out a lot of b vitamins 
and fiber. So that is something that unless you're celiac or have a real intolerance, it's, it's not something that I would advise. So in the evenings, what kind of things do you tend to eat? I would eat broccoli and cauliflower bake. And I'm assuming by this point, which is what, seven o'clock-ish? Eight uh, o'clock? Do you... Six, six thirty. Are you feeling pretty ravenous by then? No, not really. So it's, you are, you're very kind of tuned into your hunger, I'm assuming. I believe I starve myself. If I want to eat, if I'm hungry at five o'clock, I would normally have some walnuts or a piece of cheese or something like that, but only a little bit just to, to take me through to my meal. It's important to listen to your body. And actually, as we get older, we, act, we don't need to eat as much. I think we've talked about it before, haven't we? You know, they say that you need 200 fewer calories in your 50s than you did in your 30s. Um, and also, it obviously depends day to day what you're up to. So if you've gone for like a long run off, you've been really energetic, your brain demands quite a lot of energy. So I think it's really important not to have these kind of strict guidelines, but to be quite fluid. Yeah, to listen to those hunger cues, your tummy rumbling or you're feeling quite fatigued. And do you ever allow yourself to partake in a nice chunky bit of sourdough or I love sourdough actually at the weekend I would probably buy bread from a nice place instead of the regular supermarket and yeah. uh, have a piece of marmite on toast yeah delicious oh, I bread. I think last weekend we had eggy bread I haven't had that for years and it was delicious pretty comforting that always reminds me of being a kid oh, um Thing. Yeah, particularly with sourdough because it's fermented. So a lot of people who might have, they might have some grumbles, like you said, with gluten or wheat based products, find that actually they can tolerate sourdough really well because it's fermented. It's, it's broken down the, those sugars already to a degree. So it's much easier to digest. Uh, have you been making your own in lockdown? I have not bought my starter. I did put on weight during lockdown and that was because I was baking scones and Mimi was making banoffee pie. <laughs> it was kind of like every day is a weekend. <laughs> I think I went up to 57.9 was it? And it, so I'm assuming as part of your job, do you say that it's made you more aware of your diet since you, because you haven't been modeling for that long, have you? No, only, uh, nearly three years um, no my mum uh, it has always been really strict and I think I might have passed that on to my daughter also and does that affect your enjoyment though of food would you say not, not at all if we went out to dinner I would thoroughly enjoy it I would just be super strict uh, the next day it's almost like it's in the back of your mind quite a lot I feel happiest if I can go and put any item of clothing on in my wardrobe because it's a big part of your identity being stylish wearing what you want modeling looking a certain way it, it's part and parcel of who you are it is and for me it's part of being healthy I'm at my healthiest when I'm this size and I'm exercising every day feeling good too right oh totally so some people have different sizes in their wardrobes. All my sizes are the same. There are some that are slightly tighter that I have to think, is it a good day to wear that? But they're all the same size. Mm. Because you don't let yourself go outside of those parameters. Not allowed. Where, and I think it's just important to touch on, there's a, there's a movement called Health at Every Size, which that or highlights the fact that actually you know you don't have to be a certain size usually a thin size doesn't automatically equate with being healthy because there are plenty of size eight men and women you know uh, throughout the world who aren't healthy you know you could be really sedentary and be really skinny let's say you can be a size 18 and you can work out every day you can have you know plenty of muscle so I think we just have to be aware that weight doesn't equal health automatically. But can you be really healthy at size 18? Well, that the health of every size 
movement would say that you can. Somebody in a bigger body might have perfectly fine cholesterol, you know, good lipid profile, all of these things. Somebody in a smaller body might not, but equally flip it on its head. And yeah, increased weight can often mean, you know, an increased risk of diabetes, of visceral fat, of all of these things. So I just think it's important for your listeners, your followers to, to, to get that. Yes. But on the flip side, there is a real, somebody who's starving themselves and is being deprived, is feeling restricted, is living on supplements and meal replacements, that is not healthy. They are at a risk of osteoporosis, you know, eating disorders, psychological, kind of the psychological impact. I think it's a really fine line, isn't it? It is. It is. You're right. Yeah. Yeah, I think, but I do think it's a great conversation though. And I think it's great that there are plus size models, as you know, listened to and they are getting some airtime so that it's not just a certain type of person that's it's on front covers be more educated yeah. and also i think holding those kind of um there's a lot of judgment i think of people who aren't skinny. yes and you're right if we don't have the conversation and use words we don't know nobody says anything and yeah. then the conversation is never had so you would then going back to you i've been drinking trying to drink fizzy water more and I know I shouldn't be drinking fizzy water, but I don't like water. Tell me why you think you shouldn't be drinking fizzy water. Because I don't think that the bubbles are good for bones. So actually, so I've been doing a bit of a deep dive because I know that you're really into your Diet Coke, right? Shall we go into it now? Go on then. <laughs> it's not all bad news. There's, there's quite a lot of myths around... Um, around Diet Coke, Diet Pepsi, here are the facts. Mm -hmm. So, particularly with sweeteners, so uh, there's a lot of diet drinks obviously contain sweeteners to, to give them that, to, to make up for the sugar. So there's lots of different types of sugars, saccharin and aspartame, and aspartame is the one that's hit headlines probably the most, because there were, there's been lots of uh, studies done on rats where they were given these huge amounts of aspartame and they were um, developing bladder cancer. First of all, you, you know, in your diet Pepsi, you're not consuming anywhere like the amount that these rats were being given. Secondly, we're not rats. So as humans, obviously, we metabolize things completely differently. And actually, when the studies were then done on humans, it would, they were deemed to be completely safe. Sweeteners mimic the taste of sugar, don't they? But, but not the calories. So you get zero calories, but you still get that kind of sweet taste. So they're often used in, for, for weight loss. But actually, the evidence seems to be inconsistent. Some studies showed these sweeteners helped with weight loss. Some seem to show that they increased appetite. Sweeteners might change the way that you actually taste sugar. So because sweeteners are thousands, literally thousands of times sweeter than table sugar, it somehow kind of blunts your, your taste buds so that when you then taste normal kind of sweetened things, they don't feel sugary enough. Right. So therefore, to satisfy your sweet cravings, which have been kind of elevated through these um, sweeteners, yes. it, it, it takes more so then you're kind of seeking more calories and and so that's the kind of conflicting evidence i guess the one thing that i think is important is that sweeteners can affect your gut microbes and that's that's the thing that i think is the most not damning but the thing to kind of bear in mind because we're all about gut microbiome these days aren't we it's all about gut health but again the studies are inconsistent because everybody's gut microbiome is completely different so some people might tolerate it tolerate sweeteners really well others might not if there was any negative impact i would find it easy to give up i can do anything cold turkey but i can exercise it's not good to carry in an exercise bottle because i've tried that squirts everywhere when you're running it did not impact me not my skin nothing 
and that was living on it literally from morning to night without any water or anything else. Okay, so the last thing I'm going to say is that there have been some observational studies linking fizzy drinks with lower bone mineral density. Yes. Caffeine. So if your fizzy drink is, or your, your diet drink is caffeinated, I'd bear that in mind. Yes. Because there's, there's a link with lower, yeah, lower bone density. And obviously we're all about bones, aren't we? Um, but you know, everything in moderation. Yes. I don't want to be told I can't do something. Well, and it's not realistic, is it? I did have a very lovely birthday cake. Good. I hope you enjoyed every mouthful. I did. I loved it. I could eat cake every day. I love cake. You know, life is all about enjoyment, isn't it? Let's go back in. Fruit is not your bag. What about veg? I know you're big into kale, aren't you? Love kale. Love it. Uh, spinach. I made chicken soup with a load of spinach in it. It was surprisingly delicious. Because it's quite hard to get your calcium content, it, it's quite important to be mindful of, of what you're, you know, the amounts that you're taking in. We often recommend 30 different types of plant foods across a week. How close would you say you are to, to that? Oh, this you is a test of, uh, of how many vegetables do you know? <laughs> Starting with A, B, C. Yeah, yeah but that's a great game, actually. Anything herb, herb, you know, fresh herbs? Hey, I'm getting to 30. No, see, so what I, what your homework, Caroline, is going to be to track over seven days how many you can hit. See, see if you can bump it up to 30. But I think, though, that if I eat kale four times a week, that should be times four. That's one. Sorry, that's not how it works. <laughs> hey, but I'm still getting the same nutrients. <laughs> but it's not a different type. We're looking at different types. Oh my 30. God, like Natalia with her SBF not being allowed to add a 10 to a 20 to a 30. <laughs> yeah, that's just not how it works. Sorry. But you, can, you can include spices, so things like turmeric, ginger. Okay. Right, seven. And I had a ginger shot. Okay, we're up to eight. And let me know, let us know how you get on. Okay. It's also a really good way, because if you're following a kind of keto diet that's low in carbs you're invariably not going to be hitting your 30 grams of fiber a day so by switching up the amount of you know by increasing the diversity of the the plant foods that you're having it helps your fiber intake and it has a knock-on effect beneficial effect on your gut health gut health is everything not everything but it's super important really good for you know for brain mood energy Evacuation, you know, bowel movements, all of these things. Skin. It's called evacuations. Yeah, they can be. Didn't know that. <laughs> Evacuate. I've had an evacuation today. Um, yes. Yeah, so when you said thirty, is that fruit and veg? Plant foods, primarily plant. So just think plants. So let's just, you know, I'm obsessed with bowel movements. When you're following this diet, do you find that you get constipated? I can do. I did with that fast. That 72 hour fast bunged me up. Good and proper. Well, I guess there's just nothing going in, is there? Yeah, I'm not doing that again. Don't worry. Let's um, talk about the fast. Tell me why. Did you just do it to see what it was like? David said he wanted to do a 72 hour. He, he trains people. They all wanted to do it. So there were 21 people doing it in the end. And they're all on WhatsApp, all messaging how they felt. And it, it, it was so much easier, us both doing it together. Did he find it easier than you? I did coffee. He didn't do anything. And he was still exercising a bit during it. I stopped exercising. And I would say, I've spoken to three of my friends who are doctors and they've all said, A, I shouldn't be doing it. And B, it's a load of bollocks, everything you're saying. Um, but he wanted to do it. He believed and I, I think your head has a big part to play in it. You need to prove it to yourself, don't you? Yeah, it's right now. I'm anti-aging right now. It's called autophagy, 
whereby all the it's it's kind of deemed that the cells that maybe are slightly injured you know that they are they get recycled when you fast it hasn't got food coming into it goes through all the damaged cells and kind of gets rid of the ones that maybe might turn into cancer or you know so it's it, that's that's the anti-aging side of fasting but actually you i think you can hit that quite effectively simply on a 16-8 fast you don't have you know 72 two hours is really quite extreme we we tend to eat too much as in grazing throughout the day so just giving your body that break between meals actually it, it does a lot of recycling already you know it, it gives your digestion a break i do love experimenting though i'm a very much a try it you've got to try it and see particularly in the menopause world now because it's quite a thing it's quite a hot topic there are loads of celebrities and people kind of really jumping on the bandwagon and saying this is how i how i eat personalized nutrition is is very much the way forward and when i speak to people i tell people do not do what i do because it's it's going to work for so few people what i do and I wouldn't advise anyone to drink a diet drink if they were happy drinking water. That's, do that, that's obviously the healthier option. So no, don't do what I do, but it works for me. Yeah, precisely. So talk to me about your week. So weekends tend to be a bit more fluid. Are you like, my God, thank God it's Friday. Um, do you know what? Sometimes I've got to, I've got past tea time. So it's about six o'clock and I'm cooking supper and thinking, shit, I didn't have a custard cream today. Didn't have a Garibaldi, I missed out. And, and because that's a tea time thing, if I've missed out, I missed it. I can't, missed have, you. Yeah, I can't then have it for pudding after supper because that's not when you have biscuits. I just missed it. And I've got to wait until the following weekend. <laughs> wow. Okay, you almost need to set a timer on your phone so that you can max out on Garibaldi time. It's so funny. I mean, I, and that's my rule. And, and no one would even know if I had a custard cream for pudding after supper. But it's my rule. Who were your food, interestingly? No, oh, I know when you have a bunch of girls at work. Uh, so I yeah. had one friend, she would come back from the summer holidays because we were working in a school. And she always put on weight every single summer. She'd come back and say, right, got to lose weight. I'm going on Weight Watchers. And we'd all do it for a little while. So we would literally, went, we went out to a Mexican one night and we, I brought the scales with me. The waiter must have loved you. It was, it was just a fun night out. It was never, I know, I was just going to say food is not life and death, which obviously it is. But I'm open to, I'm just open. It's about fueling yourself, isn't it? But it's much more than that. It's about, like you say, it's about social interaction. It's about enjoyment. It's, yeah, there's a, it's a lot more nuanced than simply fuel. Yes. And then there's the other thing. If I'm traveling, um, and I think, are they called, uh, I always call them gremlins. Grem, grem, the things that sit on the shoulder. Ghrelin, ghrelin. So ghrelin sits on this shoulder. Yep. If you're tired and you're traveling, you've got to have a McDonald's or a Burger King. Sometimes it's the only thing that, that will satisfy that, that craving. But even if there is a green option for me, it's, uh, I think my daughter and her boyfriend often say, calories don't count at the airport. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I live life, I enjoy it. And I maybe have a McDonald's or Burger King maybe once a year. Not very often. Weekends is a, not really, it's not a blowout, but it's basically just having what you want it makes me feel good to have maybe four or five custard creams or di chocolate digestive biscuits i have it i could not have it but then that would be boring well i think what happens is if you completely restrict you then get to the point where it can it can start a kind of overeating and a binge purge cycle and all sorts of kind of disordered outcomes which is obviously not what we want so yeah you have to i think it's super important to have a, a little of what you fancy i also sometimes find that buying it satisfies my craving for it 
I don't even need to eat it. I've just bought it. And no, it's there. Exactly. Yeah. Thank you for understanding that. David does not understand that. He hunts really? the cupboards for the things he knows yeah. bought. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, just knowing it's there, knowing there that nothing is possible. I think it's a psychological kind of a buffer. It, it it makes you feel more relaxed about it. I get it. I totally get it. Yeah, I th and there's lots of psychology at play with how we eat and how we think about food. So Friday, Saturday are your more relaxed days, and then you're back on top on top of your kind of game come Sunday, right? So at the weekend, do you exercise or do you, are you relaxed about exercising too? Can I have a day off on Friday or Saturday or both if I, for some reason, don't want to, but I would always try to do something. Um, so most of your exercise is cardio focused, am I right? Are you doing any strength training? I talked about it. But it hasn't happened. I did go to the gym a few times. It just, it's like yoga, it just doesn't do anything for me. I will squat while the kettle's boiling, or I was in the queue for a Starbucks this morning and I stood on one leg, uh, that sort of thing. Balance okay. stuff. But you don't find that you get lots of injuries? Touch wood. I'm not in competition mode, so I'm just ticking over. I'm literally doing five, seven kilometers a day. Yeah. The, the important thing about you know, maintaining a certain level of mu muscle mass or doing squats or, or any of these things. It's not about aesthetics. It's about being able to get off the toilet, you know, when you're 85. This is the kind of thing that we need to be aware of and looking forward to. Yes. So one, in fact, we were doing this the day before yesterday. And we, so getting up. Yeah. On one leg. On it's leg. incredibly difficult. Yeah. yeah. But essential. Um, yeah. And being able to stand on one leg and balance with your eyes shut for longer than 13 seconds, if you're over 50, apparently. Uh, David does run training on a Tuesday and he gets everybody to do that with their eyes closed and everyone's there going. <laughs> <laughs> what, what I have taken from this is less cheese. Don't, don't take cheese out. Less saturated, more unsaturated. More diversity from plants. Will in, which will in turn impact your fibre, which I think will help with evacuations. Yes. Just keeping an eye on the, uh, the amount of diet Pepsi that you're doing. There's so much conflicting advice when it comes to nutrition, but the one thing that everybody pretty much agrees on is that we should all be eating more plants. Food for the animals. Supplements. Go on, hit me with your supplements. This is this is the thing with supplements. Quite often we're like, I'm taking the supplement, but I'm not actually sure why. <laughs> yeah, ashwagandha, which is a, an Indian kind of Ayurvedic herb. Stress management. I thought it was good to take over COVID times. Yeah, that's that's what it's been most researched for. It's known as nature's Xanax. So it is. I do, um, it's been heavily researched. Personally, I've never seen anything that robust, but I know anecdotally that lots of my clients really swear by it. Mm. It's, it's very calming. And actually it has been shown to help with, particularly with women who have got hypothyroid. Um, it's been, yeah, exactly. So it's been shown to be quite useful. Um, it has been shown for men though, so don't give it to David, to, it can potentially affect their testosterone levels. Um, and then Nutrafol, I've spoken to many people uh, about hair wellness generally and that there aren't many supplements on the market that can actually do anything. If you need something, then generally it has to be prescribed. But my nails, honestly, I now have nails and I haven't had nails for years. Okay, okay. And that's coincided with taking that, has it? I've been taking this since January. This has got uh, vitamin A, vitamin C, vitamin D, biotin, iodine. Oh, it's got iodine, 150%. Okay, yeah, so that's quite high, yeah. Um, Zinc and selenium. Yeah, okay. So all of those, particularly biotin, can be really useful for hair, nails, that combo. Um, and 
Biotin is basically just B, vitamin B7. B vitamins are really good for hair, skin and nails, really good for energy. But if you're stressed, and particularly if you have um, thyroid issues, stress kind of slices and uses up your vitamin B and vitamin C um, levels. Yeah, and the iodine, you know, the recommended amount is about 150 milligrams. You've got quite a lot in there. You just have to be careful with iodine that you don't go, because it speeds up your metabolism. Some people can go hyperthyroid. I'm assuming if it's working for my nails, which I actually have nails, so it is definitely working, then it's working for my hair. Yeah, yeah. It will be, yes, it's, um, it's useful for keratin, which is what you find in your hair and nails. So what about vitamin D? This has vitamin D in it, which is 2,500. 2,500 um, what, IU? Yes. The NHS recommendations are a minimum of 400 IU or 10 micrograms, that's the equivalent. It's really important, I think, to look at labels, especially if you're taking quite a few supplements, because suddenly you realise you're doubling up. Suddenly you're getting to kind of really, you know, super high doses. So that's it. it. It obviously works for you. I'm surprised that you can keep going and not feel hungry for the amount of time that you do. But as long as you are tuned in and you're not ignoring your hunger cues or you're not feeling really tired or shaky or hangry or irritable then it, it's working for you perfectly well yeah thank you emma has that been insightful has it been helpful i was a little bit skeptical oh, don't be telling me what i have to do and don't be telling me i have to be green and don't be telling me i have to be vegan and all of that stuff and you are very normal, if I may say, um, and very easy to talk to, and, and not at all uh, belittling or anything that I thought. Good, good. That's the last thing I want to be. And I, I think, like you said right at the beginning, nobody wants to be told what to do. It's really off-putting. And we're all human, and we're all, you know, here for a good time, aren't we? Yes. I'm sure there will be people who say that I'm doing things wrong, but it is quite nice to speak to a professional who has made me aware. Well, yeah, you're going to do some, some little tweaks and that's what it's all about. Working out whether they work for you or not. But you know, not, we don't wanna have, make these huge kind of grand changes because they just, they're not sustainable and they don't really work. So then my last question, for you probably is do I go public with that list of what I eat in a week or do I not? God, that's a really good question. I, um, I think you'd have to caveat it quite strongly saying about the whole, it works for me, but it's not necessarily gonna work for you. I'd hate for people to go, oh my God, you know, I'm a pig. I'm like, you know, eating three meals a day and Caroline is not. Thank you. And I can always add something to it if you think. I need to add some walnuts or add something just, just for the gram. Um, and uh, I'd also like to say the reason that I am made up uh, was mm -hmm. because I went to a Sephora uh, shoot this morning. So I wouldn't normally be um, dressed up. Lovely. Were they nice to you? They were so nice. They were so, so nice. And it was fun. They made me do my first TikTok. Um, mm -hmm. I know, I know. Thank you very much for giving me your time. You are so lovely. And I hope you get to meet when I...